Welcome back to the tarot series. Last video I did a I did a video on the hermit card. I did a video on the hermit card. The hermit card is very interesting just like all these cards, especially all the major cards. Not one of them is uninteresting. All of them are packed with tons and tons of juice. And the next card we have in the Majors, after the Fool, and the Magician, and the High Priestess, and the Empress, and the Emperor, and the Hierophant, and the Lovers, and the Chariot, and the Strength card, and the Hermit card, and now we have made it to the Wheel of Fortune. The Wheel of Fortune. The Wheel of of fortune. Now, you could say that when the hermit embarks upon his journey into the basement or the underworld or the darkness or the unknown or the unseen previously unseen, previously unrecognized. He's going to find the truth. The hermit is going to find the truth, carrying his own light of awareness and fearlessness into the darkness to cultivate fearlessness, to do the necessary shadow work on, a, on an individual level, and to discover his own intuition and wisdom inside that is always already present but just needs to be uncovered and he also has established or cultivated a certain inner strength and inner peace that sure is useful along the journey when we cultivate inner strength and inner peace and when we kind of establish that as our default setting man and it's a never ending process obviously we we fall off the tracks and we we go through things well i don't know i'll speak for myself i feel like i have I've established inner strength and inner um, peace as more and more of a default setting. Definitely have, I have a long way to go before that is more, you know, pronounced like all the time. But you know some i'll go through periods of time where i'm feeling inner strength and inner peace as a default setting for the most part and then something will shake me up and make me realize that i still can feel um i can lose my sense of inner peace and i can lose my sense of inner strength sometimes and then i have to return you know, the retreat and the return. We retreat from our inner peace and inner strength, and then we just return. And even if it takes a long time, the healing is in the return. So, when the hermit goes down to find truth, goes fearlessly into the dark to discover truth, he has a vision. He has a vision. You know, you could think about it almost like a shamanic thing or psychedelic thing or, you know, like the mystery schools, the, um, the Eleusis, the, the uh, Eleusinian, Eleusian, I forgot how to pronounce that, pronounce that. Um, the mystery of Eleusis in ancient Greece 
was a a uh, biannual voyage for a lot of people. They would go to Eleusis, and who knows exactly what was going on there because a lot of it was concealed in secret, even though it happened for a couple thousand years, and some some big names experienced it, such as Plato, um, and, you know, people talk about how, you know, it seems like it was a visionary experience, and probably some sort of altered state situation, whether through a psychedelic, or a ritual, or chanting, or, you know, some sort of vehicle that um, catalyzed an altered state which produced some sort of visionary experience that seemingly was a rebirth type of experience and some say one of the main thrusts of the experience was letting go of a fear of death. But, you know, we could say that this hermit, during his retreat, has a vision, or an insight, or realization. I like to think of it as a vision, and I like to think of that vision um, as this. He has a vision of the Wheel of Fortune, you know? A vision of the universe, the macrocosm, and the microcosm, and perhaps what's most important is maybe seeing a connection between the macrocosm and the microcosm, you know, this, this wheel. Um, wheels are, you know, kind of these symbolic wheels are common in a lot of mythologies and, and um, symbolism and different spiritual traditions, you know. Um, you have the Dharma wheel, in Buddhism, and you have the, the wheel of samsara, you know, constant birth and death, and kind of the cycle of suffering, basically, but, um, you know, I, in ancient Vedic texts, there's this thing called Rita, I think, I'm not sure if that's pronounced right, R-T-A, which actually preceded the idea of Dharma, but Rita um, is basically kind of the laws or patterns of the universe, you know, that seem consistent and stable and um, intelligent and keep the whole show running. Um, and then Dharma is similar to that, you know, like Dharma on a, on a, on a macro level in Hinduism is kind of the the natural the natural cycles and patterns of reality and you know that the word dharma kind of begins to have different connotations in Buddhism um but there's overlap still you know, and so there's a bunch of ways to talk about this, but basically the way that I see the Wheel of Fortune is that the hermit sees from kind of a, a bird's eye or aerial perspective, of the, sees with, with the big mind, kind of almost lets go maybe of the small, the small mind. The hermit has let go of some of the small concerns that we get trapped in and absorbed by and possessed by and consumed by. And because he has let those small things go, he now sees with this big mind and sees with a bigger perspective, sees, how, sees the interdependence of all things, sees how everything is connected. Um, so on a macro scale, I think that the Wheel of Fortune is this epiphany, basically, that allows us to see how everything is interdependent. Um, nothing exists in complete isolation, nothing exists as completely independent, 
everything is shaped by something else. At the end of the day, everything is one big organism. It's like Indra's net, um, you know, where every part is a shining jewel in this net and every jewel reflects every other jewel basically. I'm not sure if I'm getting that image completely right, but you get the point. Um, so I think on a macro scale, this epiphany is being able to see reality on um, with, with the big mind, so to speak. And, um, you know, it's hard to do that if we're completely absorbed by our own egos. And to be honest with you, I don't even really like to use the word ego because it's like it's got so many connotations and so so many spiritual people have such violent language toward the ego, which I don't like. You know, some people are more compassionate toward the ego. Obviously, Western psychology has its own, um, you know, definitions of, of the ego. So I don't really like to use that word. So I'm sorry, I just did. But, you know, if we're if we're like completely in a tunnel vision that is um, if our vision is like obscured or narrowed by, you know, our own insecurities or fears or just like worries about about what other people think or about if we're doing things right or, you know, if we're failing or if we're succeeding or, um, you know, all the mental chatter that we have that kind of keeps us on a low vibration. It's hard to see. It's hard to see with a with a bigger perspective when we're caught in that. But if we can kind of release ourselves from that, at least temporary, temporarily, sometimes, then we can kind of um, widen our our vision, you know, and and loosen it and expand it and have some spaciousness and be able to see more. And that's what the Wheel of Fortune is kind of all about, I think. And so that's on the macro scale. On the micro scale, because the hermit has gone in and look at this, looked at the psychological content and emotional content and um, shadow material and has worked through that and become aware of that and maybe started the process of cleaning up, so to speak, um, that allows us, when we go through that, that, that allows us to... Um, see how everything is is interdependent in our own lives. Like we start to be just clearly aware of what makes us who we are as an individual. You know, like we look at the past, we look at our relationships, we look at memories that have left these heavy traces upon us that still shape our sense of self. And so by really looking at all of those contents like more fearlessly and more clearly and more directly, then we can get a much bigger and better and more accurate and more meaningful sense of like all the things that make us who we are as an individual. So I would say that the Wheel of Fortune makes us see on a macro level how everything is interdependent and on a micro level how we start to see all the things that make us who we are. And then that gives us more power, but it also, you know, it, it provides, I guess it, it allows us to see our limitations in the sense that we kind of, we start to see, oh, I have this tendency because of this, you know, I have this fear because of this, I have this insecurity because of this. And that awareness is like the first step to ever making any sort of transformation. So, so yeah, I would say that this, this card is about awareness and insight and epiphany into how things are connected on a micro and macro scale. Um, and, you know, perhaps the Sphinx with the sword is a symbol of um, a symbol of some sort of, you know, some people might say that's the higher self, right? Whatever your definition of that might be. Um, maybe I'll talk about the higher self or the highest self um, more in, in another video. 
because it is a term that's used a lot, but it's another, it's also a term that's like tricky to, a bunch of people have different ideas about it, kind of, but I guess it doesn't have to be complicated. It's just our higher self, our higher potential, our higher potential. Let's just keep it at that for now. So perhaps this, this Sphinx is a symbol of an embodiment of our higher potential and you know we we have started to tap into our higher potential throughout this whole journey and but in in the case of the wheel of fortune this card allows us to tap into our high higher potential by seeing from a um a bigger perspective a more all-inclusive and honest perspective about ourselves the world others and the universe and we start to realize at this point perhaps that um we're not alone ultimately we might feel alone but we're we're actually just part of the fabric of everything just like everything else is and so you know that can be healing and can allow us to kind of like overcome our sense of separateness. So, you know, and I guess as a last point, I mentioned Dharma earlier, you know, the way that I've been thinking about Dharma, based on my own intuition, reflection, and research, <laughs> is, um, you know, like, on a, on, a, on a macro scale, Dharma is kind of like the Tao, right? It's like, the natural flow of reality and the natural balancing of reality and, and like the contrasts that are necessary for reality that also like um, are dancing in this constant kind of equilibrium or, or you know dancing in some sort of balance and play um, so Dharma on 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 a big level is 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 like the Tao, the natural flow and patterning of reality that is very intelligent and creative and from a Taoist perspective is not even conscious of itself. It's just doing what it does. And then personal Dharma is more like your own calling, you know, what you feel drawn to do, what you feel drawn to be as an individual, because we all are unique, you know, we all share so much, and we all influence each other, and we're all shaped by so many things from the external world, but nevertheless, we all are unique manifestations of reality, and we all have our own personal dharma, we all have our strengths and weaknesses, and ways to, we, we all have um, skill sets and uh, you know things to contribute to the collective and things that set us on fire in a good way you know things that make us excited things that things that make us enthusiastic and make us feel engaged with our lives and make us feel you know useful and um, and that that to me is is the personal Dharma and, you know, that makes sense. Even when you see the personal Dharma and the big Dharma together, it's like if Dharma is the natural patterning of reality and then personal Dharma is our own, you know, calling, for lack of a better word, and by following our own calling, we are aligning ourselves with the intelligent flow of reality. You know, and so that's why it feels good when we follow that call. It feels like we are aligning with the, the natural flow of things. So that's where I'm going to start. Stop for now. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you on the next video. Peace.